most of us are. Uh, if you're not, it's always nice to hear that if you're, you know, a little bit further away than Finland. So drop a line in the chat. Uh, uh, it cheers everybody up. We're already, we're, we're almost halfway through. By six o'clock, finish time, we're going to be halfway through. Well, not quite because you still have the exercise to do, but so, you know, next week when Yari starts and look at red lights, red lights, red lights. Next week, it's going to be Wednesday. It's not going to be a Thursday. So remember that. And uh, yeah, please do remember that. Four o'clock, 4.15 anyway, but it's going to be Wednesday. Why? Or, well, it's a national holiday on Thursday here in Finland. That's the reason. And let's not go there who actually changed the lectures to be on Thursday and not on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's not go there. That's a good point. <laughs> who was that? <laughs> who was that? So uh, today we're going to talk about those magical words, which actually brought, I'm going to just jump into this next slide. That was a really good point in, in one of the feedback channels. Uh, somebody asked, why so much about agility and lean? Isn't organizational change a much wider topic? Absolutely. Of course, it is a much wider topic. However, a couple of reasons why we focus on this or lean agile design perspective is first of all it's practical and one of the themes and the theoretical backgrounds for us is kind of this practice driven approach remember the john shook principle but changing organization culture happens through behavior practice so that's that's where it fits in that's kind of our perspective second it's very topical you know if you go out there and talk about organizational change in the past I don't know, five to 10 years, and I'm saying five to 10 years into the future, these buzzwords are gonna pop up. So that's a good reason. And third, it's a great example. And actually one more reason is, that's something I know about. Uh, so I'd rather not talk about stuff that I'm not an expert of, but these things I kind of consider myself an expert. And we can't cover everything in this, this uh, course. So let's cover the stuff that Yari and myself are comfortable with and we think are important and topical and so forth. However, last year also this was brought up and I kept this slide from last year because I was supervising a master's thesis, thesis on change management. So it was very easy for me to just give pointers that of course change management, that's I, I guess there could almost be a department in some university focusing on change management, it's such a big, big academic topic. So there's there's plenty of models. There's a lot of literature. So you know, check them out. And, and for example, the one is from 1951, which is just a great example of how change management has been studied for quite a long time. And uh, there you can actually see the master's thesis where where Niklas studied these models, part of uh, how to educate artificial, artificial intelligence capabilities in an insurance company. But that was Niklas. Well, let's talk about you. Exercise two. Uh, thanks for everybody for submitting them. Uh, I think it was Kiara or Lee who just commented earlier today that excellent, pretty much everybody actually returned the exercise and in time, more or less. So it's really fantastic. The wheels are turning smoothly and smoothly. A couple of things. I, again, picked up a few things you said that I thought were brilliant, insightful, or otherwise important. This is kind of the same, the same with the exercise last week, which we call the temporal onion. The same as with the static onion is that, of course, the whole point is the bigger context and reminding yourself of the big picture. This one I liked a lot. Uh, it works in Finnish the best, uh, but one of you wrote that big change, big changes take time and having a roadmap, kind of a temporal dimension of what's going to happen really soothes you. It makes you calm in all of this uncertainty. And I love the Finnish expression, roadmap rauho. I'm going to use that forever now on. That was, that's brilliant. Uh, and this one, when something new is developed, it's beneficial to be conversational from the beginning. That was, that was great. That's really well said. Especially, you know, like I underline over there or highlight the conversational. So it doesn't have to be... <laughs> 
doesn't have to be official or stiff or you know top-down orders, but rather definitely have the conversational approach. That's already uh, more about facilitation there. How do you make people willingly talk about these issues? This one was great. So uh, the person wrote, it's interesting to try and figure out the past. We are now solving problems that derive from the decisions made in the past. And then the person continued wondering what kind of problems our decisions made today generate after five years from now. Uh, that's a really nice way because immediately I kind of thinking, yeah, you could kind of make this time machine exercise with, with the temporal onion that, you know, jump into the future and look at your present time as some decisions that you're going to have to live with. You know, just kind of another maybe a facilitation gimmick of how do you have people, how do you make people think about whatever you do today or this month or this year, what are the implications in the future? It's, it is really about, and then it, it helps you to understand how the past actually shapes the decisions we do today. Whether it's a small thing or a big project, that's, that's the fact. And that was the whole point of the temporal onion was to help you to think about the future. And, and based on this quotation, think about the future as a past, <laughs> as a history. How would you like to this project today be written in the history books? And that's a really nice way of starting the conversation about the impact and what is desired and so forth. So uh, at least to me, I think that was that was an insightful, thought-provoking comment. And at last, uh, thank you for the uh, candid feedback. Uh, somebody wrote that, yeah, I'm kind of missing the bit, I'm <laughs> missing a bit the objective of this exercise. Why are, why are we making you do this in relation to change management? Good, I'm gonna try to clarify things and then build a bridge towards exercise number three. So here we go. Now, We've had these two exercises by now. And they are there to clarify. The first one was really to help you to clarify the organizational context for change. So if you are doing change, whether it's a small change, let's say that, you know, I want to change how I do things in my work, or I want to change the work I do. Well, you need to understand the bigger organizational context for you to be successful. And then last week, of course, we had the point of the exercise was that, okay, if you want change, then what's actually, how do you help people to clarify what's the desired impact of that change? Well, let's draw a timeline and let's talk about the future and let's talk about the past. That was the exercise last week. And kind of hoping at, at this stage that we've now done two exercises, just make a note that these are facilitation tools, these super simple drawings that we have made you do. And we, of course, intentionally made it so that you have to do it for the other per pe person's project. They are facilitation tools. So what I mean by this is that the facilitator is not as such responsible for the outcome. The other person is. So you have a little bit different approach with the tools. The idea for the tools is not to get the right answers. The idea with these tools is to start the conversation and start the thought process of how do the people who have to come up with the answers, how do they spot problems, issues, risks, what kind of actions they have to take. So, it's a very thin, you know, it's, it's, it's a thin line between these two that you actually use tools to get the answers. For example, what's our goal? You might have a tool to help you understand what is the goal, but it's a slightly different tool and a very different approach if you're trying to help the other people to come up with what is our goal. And this distinction, once you get it, then, then you kind of graduate from the facilitator academy. That's kind of number one, but it's 
although it sounds very simple, it's not that easy to understand in my experience. And I actually talked this week with another colleague of mine, and he said that, you know, there's a lot of service design professionals who do a lot of facilitation and they don't make this distinction. Uh, they kind of think that I have to, I have to make the, I have to have the answers. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but just to understand your role as a facilitator or actually a responsible person, that's, that's important. So like I say in the second speech bubble, spot the difference between facilitating an answer and actually coming up with an answer. And the tools we show you here are for facilitating the answer. You can have the Lean Canvas, Business Model Canvas, Lean Service, you know, the world's full of tools to coming up with the answer. We're talking about facilitating an answer. That might be the, one of the main points of today's lecture, by the way. Uh, can I say yeah. something? Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. I, I would say that this is one, one of the main points of the whole course. Uh, when we talk about the change agent role, of course, there, there's a, because we, we tend to be so knowledgeable, we have so many good ideas, and we know better. <laughs> That's our, our tendency, and, and and really putting that aside a bit when we are in a facilitator role and helper role. And next week we will talk about that more. But but I, I would like to emphasize that this, this is one of the key key moments and key key challenges as well that, that we did make distinction between distinction between these, these two. Uh, yeah. And uh, yes, just wanted to emphasize. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Yari. Absolutely. And I guess you can take the word leadership here as well. You know, let's, let's not go there, but you know, what is leadership? Is it that you tell people what are the answers or is it that you facilitate people to come up with the answers themselves? Let's go for exercise number three, because that's the third one in our uh, three facilitation exercises. So we first had a tool to facilitate the organizational context, a tool to facilitate the desired impact. And now dun, da, da, we're going to have a tool to facilitate the success criteria. And it's a dumb tool. And sure, most of you are familiar with it. It, it goes with the theme that we have that our, all our tools are dumb, silly, and simple. So this is literally dumb. And of course, the dumb is an acronym for these the four words, that if you set a goal, it should be doable, that it's realistically done in the given time frame and the resources. It's understandable. Everybody who's married to the tool, uh, to the goal, understands what, what we are trying to achieve. It's measurable to some degree. You should be able, when you're done, you should be able to say whether you achieved the goal or you didn't. That's what measurable means. It doesn't mean that it has to be a number, no. In my interpretation, it means you need to be able to know whether you have reached the goal or not. Fourth, it should be beneficial, which is obvious, which is, yeah, it should take you towards the desired impact that you have just done in the previous exercise. I'm not saying this is easy, although it is dumb. Sometimes getting dumb goals is difficult. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But it's always, always, always worth pursuing. Because whatever comes up with the conversations of coming up with the dumb answers is going to be beneficial. Some people use SMART goals, and then you have these keywords, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Yeah, but hey, I'm more of a dumb person, so let's go with the dumb goals. There might be another acronyms to use here, but I'm sure you get the point of them. So here's my point. Let's go how easy this all is. We all know goals are important. We should have goals, especially when there's more than one person, we need to kind of go towards the same goal. Communication is important. We have talked about that in, in this course as well. So it's kind of obvious that communicating goals is important. But it's not that easy. Why is it so hard? If everybody agrees that communicating the goals is important, why is it so hard? Well, first of all, I think one of the big problems is ambiguity. So we are, 
we don't give ourselves enough hard time of understanding, making the goals clear. And I really focus on this, that we are so, I, I've seen so many times, I've written myself so many goals, but it's not clear whether we have achieved them. And the problem is, of course, that typically we're doing complex stuff and it involves a lot of, it's not that simple to say how to make a good measurable goal. So for example, uh, we could have goals like this. The user experience has changed. That's our goal. Or our staff has updated their ways of working. Uh, we have new customers. That's a good goal. Hey, that's a good business goal. We need new customers. Let's put that as a goal. Or we need a healthy organization. Yeah, absolutely. That's a brilliant goal. Well, the problem is that it doesn't take much to start question, you know, the ambiguity of them. So if we're saying that user experience has changed, so we just changed the user interface and that's it, is that enough? Or, or what does actually that second goal mean? That's super ambiguous. We have new customers. Yeah, fantastic. I just got one, is that enough? Well, it depends. If it's like a huge corporate customer that will provide you know, revenue for the five years, maybe it is. But let's say if you're Facebook, perhaps one new customer is not quite enough. And then of course the whole healthy, no. And that's the ambiguity. And now if we are a group of people or a community of people and we're trying to work towards the same goal, these ambiguities matter. So what would be dumb goals? So the dumb goals, like the idea is that you know whether it is or it is not. So something like this, oops, sorry. 200 new customers by June. That's pretty easily known whether you have achieved it or not. Funding proposal, accepted, not accepted. My thesis submitted, it is submitted or it isn't submitted. There's no ambiguity between them. You know, you take the business model canvas and you, you know, think that at least seven of our 10 teams should be using it by the end of summer. That's a yes or no go. That's measurable. Whether it's beneficial, that's another question. Whether it's doable, that's another question as well. But it's the measurability of this where we typically miss the point or, or it becomes very difficult. But why is it difficult? And this is my take, what's the brick wall? Why is it so difficult to have clear goals? So here are a couple of excuses. And this is why we need facilitation. First of all, yeah, it's complex, it's difficult. It's not that easy. You have an abstract goal, which is perfectly fine. And now you try to make sub goals that are D-U-M-B, especially measurable. It's not easy, make no mistake. Maybe sometimes it's not my job, it's our boss's job. They're responsible for the bigger thing. Or, or maybe you say there's so many stakeholders, it's a network of people, I, you know, let's not do it, it's just too difficult. Or maybe you go, we just can't measure it. It's too difficult to measure. We can't put a number on it. And uh, then one of my favorites is, that we'll see, you know, time will show whether we have succeeded or not. You know, we'll see whether we have been successful. No point of working on this beforehand. Or we have never done it before, so why start? And then last one, no one asked it. <laughs> no one asked for it. So how do we facilitate these things? So this is pretty much what I'm asking you to do next week, which is probably obvious at this stage. And I'm asking you to play dumb. That's this week's exercise. Dumb for the other person. So the other person will have a project and you need to start helping them to come with dumb goals. So just, you know, it's very simple questions. Again, the conversation starts. Uh, how will you know you have been successful? What needs to happen six months from now for you to be happy? Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, that the happy part is just a little trick you can play so it doesn't go into official KPIs. But it's like, what would you make happy? What do you think is a good goal here? You know, what would make you proud? What would make your team proud? And so how will you know if that has not happened? That's another way of approaching these questions. Uh, how would that be beneficial? Is one customer enough? How many then? Or, or you know, Let's have more revenue, okay? Can you give me a number, a percentage, so forth and so forth? 
kind of as a facilitator, this is very simple, as you can see. Uh, but let's try that out and let's see what happens. And I'm sure you, again, you have a lot of experience in this, whether you just, you know, you haven't maybe realized it. But the fun part, the fun part is to doing this in pairs. So you could definitely have a distinction between the person who needs to come up with the answers and the person who's asking those dumb questions. Now, here's a little trick I do. Uh, I've, I've been doing this for ages. It's just to, sometimes the problem is that when we talk about goals, they become too official or, or too formal. So there's a little trick I use is, is playing dumb with champagne. So, you know, just set up the thing like this. I bought our team a bottle of very expensive champagne. And we shall drink this bottle if we have been successful in one month. So let's now, the whole team, come up with you know, four criteria whether we can drink this champagne at the beginning of June. And then you write down on a piece of paper, stick it on a champagne bottle and put it in the refrigerator. And then after one month, open the refrigerator and then you can look, did we meet those four criteria? Yes, we did take the champagne and drink. If we didn't, yeah, let's leave it there and have a new set of goals. That's as simple as it gets. It doesn't have to be, you know, oh, we need to talk with HR about our incentives and the business proposals and everything. No, no, no. You know, what would make you happy? What lets us drink this champagne? What are the criteria whether we can celebrate or not? So really think about it. You know, maybe have fun with this this week's exercise. Ask the other person, okay, if, we if I had a bottle of champagne, write me down the criteria. And the fun part about this exercise and when I have using it is that the other, the person getting the champagne writes down the criteria for themselves. And typically if I'm, I'm the supervisor or the boss, I'm like, uh-huh, okay. Mm -hmm. So is that, and, and, you know, I'm not giving any success metrics I'm letting the other person to define their own success metrics. And, and that's a big, people are not necessarily used to that. They're like, well, the boss tells me the success metrics. Okay, let's try that. I'm not going to say anything. What are the criteria for the champagne? So here we have, those are the three exercises. The third one we're going to have uh, starting today. And when we put these together, you can see what's, what, what we are driving you to do that, you know, it's a one continuous goal clarification exercise. We have ambiguous objectives. We get the contextual objectives, desired impact. We get impact, impactful objectives. And then we do the final clarification with the dumb criteria. And we can get these dumb objectives. So it's actually three cycles of clarifying what are your goals. And that's mostly what you will probably be doing as a facilitator. Because the, the exercise is fitting, because exercise is all about asking, listening, and drawing. And that's really kind of the gist of the whole facilitation. And the context here, what we have been talking in this course is of course organizational change, but I would be pretty certain that, hey, it actually works for any project. It doesn't take much to turn this into a thesis project, you know, for those students over there. Uh, maybe a little bit of an overkill for your gardening projects if you have them, but at your work context, just think about it. Does it work for any project where you need to clarify the goals? Hmm. Okay, that was exercise two with the segue to exercise three. So it's criteria for champagne this week. Nothing stopping you from buying real champagne if you want. Unfortunately, we don't have the budget for that, except for us uh, teachers. Let's move on. So let's get to the topic of today. So okay, kind of recapping first two lectures. Okay, here's where we are. So imagine yourself as an organizational change agent. You know, I got to make the organization responsive to remain competitive. There's this fog of uncertainty we talked about. 
Uh, there's various lenses, not a single truth. And then you kind of bought the John Shook thing that let's make this change by doing and people's behavior. Okay, that's where we are. Let's see what we have. Uh, hopefully you have a vision. Oh, we need a new culture, a new dog. No, vaguely speaking. And, and in a real situation, hopefully a little bit more detailed vision. We have a change program or at least six steps that we know kind of a framework of a change program for the organization. Uh, we understand the context for the change. We did the onion. We understand the desired impact. We just did the temporal audio. And now we have clarified the goals with the dumb exercise. So that's what we have already. And remember this uncertainty, that's the kind of the context typically where we want to change. We want to change because of uncertainty. And that was the whole John Shook thing that we can plan it. We must build a responsive culture. We need to do a culture of doing that becomes routines and tools. And that's where the whole lean startup agile design, you know, tools and canvases and models and diagrams come in because these are very good in this going from uncertainty and building a competitive advantage for the whole organization. Remember this from lecture one. So that's where we are. So the question is, where do you start? We have these different schools of thought. We have these different approaches. There's design, agile, lean. There's even lean startup, which is a very different thing. So if this is all the medicine, which or the vitamins, which one should I take first? Uh, let's go over quickly. Uh, I'm sure you'll know a little bit about everything. I'm not going to explain all of these, but just you know, have a screenshot for each one. Agile, the history comes from software development. It's very much about the team. How does the team focus on creating values? has these principles of value, of valuing individuals and their interactions. It has a value of building working software, customer collaboration is highly valued and being able to respond to change. So that's the one school of thought. Hmm, maybe we should take that. Well, what's the good about, yeah, yeah, that has a lot of good stuff. I'll take something out of that. Then we have the more, the, the kind of the lean transformation model. That's a lot of good things as well, obviously, and has, you know, this as well has literature and books and trainings and education, quite a lot. The whole idea is the situational approach. Hmm, that's good because that's the same as having a context, understanding the context and, you know, working on and from the context. Capability development, yeah, focuses on people's skills. And, and how people continuously improve, that's a good one. And continuous improvement of the process we're working with, good, good, this is great. And uh, yeah, I'll take something from that or another way of looking lean, similar kind of a lean house, if you will. You can get, you know, have a systematic problem solving uh, and, and we do actions and then we reflect on them and then we do actions again. And that's how we create a learning organization. Hey, that's good. That's what I was supposed to do. Yeah, that's really good. I'll, I'll take something from that as well. Systematic waste elimination. Absolutely, excellent idea. Systematically help people to do meaningful work and, and stuff that actually matters and is valuable. Good. Six Sigma lead. That goes more into how should I, a little bit more concrete that we have a logistics chain such as in this picture and we can start thinking about where are the waste is, where, what, what, what are we doing wrong when we're giving this product to our customers and what are the typical problems we have. Hey, there's a lot of into that. Lean startup. Hey, this is the book I read just last week. It has this brilliant thinking about that we should build, measure, learn. That we should have this cycle of action where we have you know, ideas, and then we actually build something concrete to test that idea and measure with real people in a real context. And then we learn from it, and then we get new ideas and we build and we rotate the cycle. And what about, you know, old, good old design thinking, human-centric thinking? Yeah, we should probably start with the desirability. Does anybody want this change or does any of our customers want our products and, and we are, you know, is our new design organization, is it viable, is it feasible and so 
And this is actually a snapshot from a video I have for you this week to, uh, as a further reading. So this is from Jeff, Jeff Gotthelf. And uh, what he did, he kind of brought all of these things together and made another set of principles. And you can say it's, it's a nice kind of that, you know, he went and picked and he has a lot of good arguments for choosing those. And it, like it says over there, these are principles that work with any methodology. Uh, so that's a, that's have a good takeaway. Definitely look over the video, look over the talk. What I'm asking here now is that even Jeff is kind of taking the, all the medicine and making a new medicine and there's nothing wrong with it. But what I'm asking together with you is that if these are the medicine, what's actually the illness behind it? If these are the solutions, if these are the approaches for organizational change under these circumstances, what's the problem that we're trying to change or solve? And here's my take on it. If we take design, lean, lean startup, and uh, you know, agile, and kind of put them together and look, look <laughs> towards the sun and kind of that, what, what kind of comes through? What is similar with all of these? What are the clear similarities between all of these different approaches? My argument is that thing in the middle. They are all trying to cure or give an answer to those two questions. What is valuable work? So when do we have smart people doing stuff? What is val they need to know what is valuable and also what is valued in general. Not just, you know, if I spend one day doing this, is this valuable for us? But also kind of culturally, what is valued in general? That's really what comes through from all of these schools of thought. And also stuff like that I have in the list. Lots, lots and lots about how does a team work? How do you deal with uncertainty? How do you communicate with stakeholders within the team, with your customers? And how you do not get fixed with your solution. So if we take that value thing, so if we put this, all of these together and the common denominator is value. So does it mean that if I'm a leader or I'm a facilitator, the answer is that I will just tell people what is value and everything starts kind of falling into place. Is that how it works? So if the value is the key question, if value is the illness, let's just solve value. And to give you an example, um, you know, this is almost like another bing now. Have you heard, have you seen a sentence like this? Now it is bingo, you could write bingo there in the chat. It is bingo if you find all of them familiar, that you have been in a situation where somebody said something, something value driven, or, you know, we should reduce waste and focus on value. And, you know, let's do something valuable to our customers. The point of this company is to create values and they deliver value. My point is that it kind of feels sometimes that as long as if we just solve what is meant by value, then actually things start falling into place because the value term is so much used in contemporary leadership conversations and all of that. Now we're getting to the problem with the problem. Now let's say that we have a thousand employees. Well, of course they have thousand different definitions of what is value and valuable. And if you just go and say, let's create value. Hmm, you can see what the problem is. And the thing with the term and the concept of value is that it's not something you can just buy from the grocery store and insert into the organization. It's not like you can take a dictionary and say, this is what is value. And then you're just gonna put it into the organization machine and it starts working better. The problem is that there are no ready answers 
or things such as value or it's questions such as what is valuable for us because it's just like what Yari talked about, the whole organization. It's so contextual, it's processual, it is relational. And, and we're gonna get back to that after the break. But what we can start doing, and that's the point of today's lecture, is that we can start a process to create shared meanings. What do we mean by value in our team? What do we consider valuable work in our department? What do we consider customer value to be for our company? And that's, of course, like I said, that's a process. That takes time. That is what facilitation is very much about. And it might be a little bit discouraging that what we have been telling you here is that there's no single tangible organization culture. It's not a singular thing that you can start changing. There are lenses and there are experiences and relations and, you know, no, that's what we talked about uh, two lectures ago. And now I'm also telling you that this kind of key component that everybody's talking about value, valuable, there's not a clear definition for that either. So I don't blame anybody for kind of sitting there on the beach and being slightly depressed and going that. No, I really like the old way of leadership. That this is the organization and I'm going to define you what is value and what is valuable. Yep. Now let's see what you have been saying or thinking. I'm gonna now have a look at chat. Any, any comments you wanna just put there? Uh, Melanie, the difficulty comes when the one whom you facilitate doesn't take ownership of the answers they generate. How to deal with that? Excellent point. <laughs> As a former consultant, nothing is more depressing than doing the, cost, the client's job because they're not taking ownership for their own business. Uh, I don't know, at some degree, it's kind of just, you know, what can you do? Uh, somehow you probably need to spot that. I might've mentioned this earlier, but I did once that I had kind of a similar situation. I had five gentlemen working on a canvas, writing down their objectives. And I got this feeling that they're not really owning them. So I made them write down their signatures in the canvas and telling them that, hey, you're not writing these answers to the teacher. You're writing these for yourselves. So let's have some accountability. Can you please all sign this paper and let's make it official? So that was a little bit of a trick. Everybody was laughing. But yeah, it was official. It had their signatures. I might have mentioned that preferably they would sign it in their own blood, but we just had uh, ink. See, I say consultant facilitator contrast. Seems like when you started as a consultant, it's hard to relearn to be a mere facilitator somehow. Yes. And also goes to the leadership part. And those of you who are supervisors, bosses for other people, it, it is this balancing. How much do you tell people things and how much you kind of want them to kind of find the answers themselves. Also a teacher's kind of everyday balancing act. And Ariani makes a good point. We're gonna come back to that in the after, uh, in, after the break. Overall, people tend to take change more openly if they have a chance to participate. Absolutely. We're going to be talking about that. And Sonia says, according to my experience, it is equally difficult for the leadership to understand that the facilitator is not responsible for making the change happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is, it is very much about clarifying what is the role of the facilitator and, and whether there needs to be a distinct line who makes the decisions and so forth. 
conflict of interest or identified resistance from within the team and the organization. Yeah. Yari's comment. Doable goals don't usually disrupt or change anything. They keep things rolling. Mm, that's a good point. It is, of course, again, the facilitator asks you to do doable goals, but then as a decision maker, you need to kind of calibrate whether are you going to make the goals a little bit higher because you believe that people that achieve much more and are, are you going to make them conservative goals a lot of people enjoying champagne and arto you put a good question how to ensure there's enough level of ambition in them hmm? That's kind of goes back to the talk about ownership and accountability and, and kind of the heavy, <laughs> heavy, heavy question for the people who's responsible for them at the end of the day. Are people just writing these goals because you won't let them leave the room before you have written them? Then they're probably not ambitious goals. They're going to be writing them just because you asked them or forced them to do it. Or are they writing the goals so that they actually use the goals themselves as tools to grow, to, to learn, to, you know, be ambitious, like you put it. And of course, the OKRs uh, are, are a good example of this that has happened in the past five years or, or even less, and they're very popular. How do you actually make goal setting kind of a framework and tools from Google about goal setting on an organization? If the team decides for a goal to open the champagne, would you max four cups of coffee or something similar? Yeah. Well, then the team, you know, if the team themselves says that the champagne goal is that, you know, we drink four cups of coffee by the end of the month and we can open the champagne. Well, <laughs> they know themselves that they are not taking it seriously and they know themselves that they're making kind of a they're not doing a favor for themselves either. But it's a good way of measuring also how committed, how much ownership and how much, you know, what's the stage of the team? You know, you could take the dumb goals exercise as kind of a test, the level of commitment, you know, the ambitiousness, the, how well does this team work or, or how well do they understand where we are going? And if, you know, if any of you have been facilitating similar situations, you know quite well that you can very quickly see the kind of the situations about the team and the people and their kind of knowledge levels just by putting them through this exercise. And then we have a couple of more comments getting close to five. When it comes to value, perhaps organization and smaller units could benefit from really placing a let's create and deliver value mindset with let's go create and share value with partners and customers. Good. Yes. I mean, more of a network. Doesn't, of course, solve what is value. And the more people you bring, the more you need to facilitate a shared meaning for the word value. And the discussion theme of value is very important and difficult. In some business fields, value and rewarding are connected. Yeah. You change value, change rules of rewarding. I can tell this is emotional. It is a cultural change. Absolutely. And definitely the word value is often synonymous to money or profits. And then it goes into incentive systems, especially if you have salary bonuses and all of that. And when you have incentives and individual bonuses, it gets personal. So maybe that's something, at least what I took on from your comment as well. And when it gets personal, it gets emotional. So uh, that's why a good we need facilitation. And that's why the whole thing of facilitation is to unsurface these things that might be blocking us from achieving the actual business goals. That's five o'clock. Uh, I hope I didn't go too fast uh, because some people said that last time was a bit fast. But here we are. Time for our five minute break, and then we go into shared meanings and the breakout room. See you. I'll continue five past five. <laughs>